now that we look at these plants, where did they come from? We can go back thousands and thousands of years. You know, I showed you those uh, pictures early on of the trees that were 80,000 years old. When did man decide that he could start using these? When did man decide that he could start growing some of these vegetables? So how did he start growing some of these vegetables? We usually think of there's like six different areas, or maybe seven different areas where man started a civilization. Uh, it might have started completely in Africa. You know, we're not sure. We don't have as many digs around the rest of the world uh, to see where man originated. We do know that there are these areas, uh, one in South America, where the Incans were, uh, another in Mesoamerica, along where Mexico might be, another one in Illinois, where the Cahokia civilization was. And we skip over to Europe, that area now between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, where we think in the past that most of our agriculture originated. Although now we're finding out now it is in these other areas. Uh, and then in China, and then in some of the islands uh, just south of China, maybe we have in those highlands there on the islands, along Borneo and Malaysia, we may have another culture. As we look at these areas, this allowed us to see that some plants evolved in China, and fortunately through trading, it was brought around. We can look at fossils and using uh, isotope of carbon, 14 carbon, to see how old they were. This allows us to, number one, date this, and to see where did plants come from. We have a good idea here on this one where they came from. Uh, we can go back now, of course, and look at the DNA to even get a better idea where they came from. But look at this map uh, along the way here. And one of the things that you see is that over here in the United States, uh, over here in the United States, right there, we have very few things. We have the sunflower, strawberries. We probably have, it's not up there, but the Jerusalem artichoke. So not very much in the way of vegetables that we eat originated in North America. Look at South America. We have a lot now that are there. Potato, the peanut, uh, beans. Uh, in Mexico, look at we had the corn, which is the most successful crop we have. Tomato, uh, we have peppers. Just think of the cultures that are out there uh, for example, the Italians, they use a lot of peppers. That was brought over by the United States. Ireland. These are the potatoes brought over from uh, uh, Mexico. How about tomatoes? How did they come to the United States? They didn't come up by people traveling via Mexico and across the deserts. They came up by ship that were first went to uh, Europe, and then the ship came back to us. I'd like to take a quick step back here to look at some things you probably learned in high school as a review over uh, Adams. And this becomes very important because it allows us to see what's going on in the rest of the universe. As a quick review, uh, remember we have an atom, which is composed of the proton, electron, and neutron, which is the smallest unit of an element. You know, we hook two of them together, we can get water. Just like it's a molecule, which is two or more atoms linked together. An element that has only one kind of atom, a compound which has two or more elements. And I've shown you some pictures here of some common ones. I've shown you the picture here of the rings around the atoms. And one of the ways that atoms hook up to each other is when these rings are empty, you can fill them up with electrons from another atom. And this allows us to get molecules together. Uh, and again, why is this important? Well, we look out there and with our microscopes, with our telescopes, to see what's going on in the rest of the world. I told you about the Mars rover founding those nine common elements. Well, what about comets? Comets, the comets bring some of the early life forms to Earth. Uh, we know that they have water on them. 
some people have theorized that they actually got most of the water from the Earth. We did some through chemical processes, but the comets, as they hit the Earth in its early stages, brought a lot of water. We can look out there to uh, different parts of the universe, such as this great Orion Nebula. And maybe we can find carbon-containing molecules. If we find carbon-containing molecules, that means there is a possibility for life out there. We are now finding, with the Hubble telescope, many of these different planets, actually, now, that may have life. Because when you think about it, we're talking about a trillion, trillion, trillion uh, possible planets out there. Um, and that's just related to the sun. Now, if each of them have nine or ten, we're talking about many more planets out there, some of which may be habitable by people like us. Uh, this is the uh, another space telescope which looks out there for the building blocks in, of life. Uh, we look for water and organic molecules. This particular one was looking at this small little galaxy, and again, found that there was ice there found that there was neon gas there, found that there was carbon dioxide. This means that possible we are not alone. There may be life in other planets out there in the world. Uh, this is a quick picture of water uh, with oxygen and the two hydrogens. And you notice it's sort of a Y shape. And because of this, as it looks up, remember I showed you those pictures of the filling in the electron rings? Because of that, that allows water to be slightly positive on one side and slightly negative on the other. So this allows the molecules to stick to each other. And again, why is that important? That allows water then to be pulled up into a plant. So uh, just like us, the plants have a type of artery and vein, which are called the xylem and phloem. It, water now can be pulled up to the top of that giant redwood. 300 and some odd feet up into the sky because the water sticks together. You've done that yourself when you've held a straw over water. The pressure on one end, it'll hold the water. Now, because of this also, water floats. And as it gets colder, we form ice and that floats. Can you imagine what the world would be like if the ice sunk to the bottom? It's also very important because uh, what these people are doing here, they're making a core in the ice. You can go down, and if the ice hasn't melted, it keeps whatever was in the air with it. So you can go to Antarctica and go down several miles and find out what the world was like 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago. It gives us an idea of what the world was like. Water is also important because it can store the heat. So as those sun rays come in, if they're not bounced back by the ice, but the water takes it up. Uh, at one point, the Earth was just a, a solid ball of ice. We allowed it to get warm, and it's been warm for thousands of years now because of these properties of the water. Uh, there's other things that plants have uh, that we're interested in. We all talk about nutrition, and we'll talk about nutrition later on. Um, we have proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. Um, we, as humans, cannot make all the essential amino acids that we need. There's 20 of these that our body needs. We can't do that, so we have to rely upon plants to get our sources of amino acids. People through trial and error, through their shamans, through their medicine demands, have learned that you need to combine certain foods together. Wheat and corn, for example, are high in protein, but, yo but low in lysine and tryptophan. Beans, peas, and soybeans, again, are like excellent protein source, but they don't have the thiamine. So different cultures have learned we need to put these together. We need to have corn and beans together. We need to have a combination of wheat and peas. In 2004, 10 million kids under the age of five died. It's because of undernutrition. Here's a uh, example of a child who 
doesn't look too bad. Looks a little skinny, but he's actually dying because he doesn't have enough protein in his diet. We can solve that uh, with new techniques of farming, new techniques of growing. We can solve the problem of malnutrition. Um, Plants have all sorts of secondary characteristics that we need to look at also. We, we're going to talk a little bit more about the proteins, the carbohydrates, and the fats as we get along. We're also going to talk about the other compounds that are out there. Uh, you know, in the past couple of weeks, we had the flu season. You went to the drugstore, and what did you see? You saw packages of echinacea. That's that uh, purple flower that you see right there. Uh, that purple flower may help us with our immunity. And so you can buy uh, tablets that have zinc and echinacea and may help us with colds. The ginkgo tree, which is in the middle, that's been around f for thousands of years. We found that extracts from this, these secondary compounds may help us with memory, may, f may put off Alzheimer's disease. It may help us with the blood clotting, may stop heart attacks. Uh, the last is the yellow flowered one is St. John's wort. Um, it, we use that as a landscape plant around here. However, in Europe, they use extracts of that to treat depression. It's the primary way to treat depression over in Europe. Uh, other ones are divided into terpenes, terpenoids, phenolics, and alkaloids. Uh, the important thing to remember about that is that these, again, are these secondary compounds which help us deal with life. It's a picture of a rose. Uh, this rose can be put into perfumes. Uh, later on, I'm going to show you how to take the essence out of that rose so you can make rose water. Uh, may be helpful at home. We also have know that, uh, for example, that carrots have carotene in there. It may help us with our vision. Citronella. Uh, may help us stop uh, mosquitoes from coming, pirate them, uh, stop some uh, bugs, rubber, we all know about. These are, again, secondary compounds which may help us deal with life. Here's a picture of vanilla bean uh, This grows out there. We, to this day, we're still not able to copy exactly this vanilla bean. So when you go to the store and buy vanilla, most of the time it's imitation vanilla, much cheaper. You can go buy that bean, it's pretty expensive. Plants have also learned to protect themselves from the sun. They have their own type of uh, lotion, in a way, to stop from getting sunburns. Uh, plants have learned to protect themselves. Uh, uh, we eat chocolate now. It, it may be even better than vegetables to help us get rid of free radicals in our system. Uh, plants have learned protection. This is a peyote. Uh, you can be in the southwest and walk along and you may find these things uh, growing in the desert. We use that. However, animals have learned to stay away from that because they ate this plant and it's one of its secondary defenses was to cause a little, cause a little psychotic reaction. So a cow ate that, it got a little psychotic, then they fall into a ravine and die. Um, hemlock was something that Socrates had. That's what made him die. Quinine, we used that to treat malaria. Uh, Reserpine, um, that's something used to take uh, high blood pressure. We're going to look at a lot of these things in the different units to come. Plants can replace all of our oil products that we have out there. Uh, this gives you an idea of the world energy usage. Not much are based upon plants now. You can go to Brazil. All the gasoline in Brazil now is made from plants. Um, the sugarcane plant supplies the gasoline. We can do that here. We can save all of this energy products with renewable plant products. Uh, here's a picture of grass. Uh, we can grow this in America, and this grass may solve all of our heating problems, all of our gasoline problems. Remember, it's a renewable energy source. So this is just some highlights that uh, we have looked at uh, an introduction, and as the units go on, we'll delve into them more.